Hello, everybody, and welcome to our continuing coverage of the second annual Dogman Encrypted Conference here in White Settlement, Texas. We are here right now with Adam Davies. How you doing, bud? I'm good, Chris. It's been good to see you again. You too, man. I love following you on social media. You are always out in the field doing all kinds of stuff. How have the investigations been going for you? They've been fascinating. What I've been trying to do recently, because I'm living in Tennessee right mm-hmm. now, I was doing, I was outdoors doing things, as you know, every week for days and days, trying to learn the local flora and fauna. And then I started to do investigations into things in the area that particularly mm. interested me uh, as I'm here. And some of those were the anecdotal stories and accounts of feral humans, and whether they existed, and also investigating some of the big mysteries there. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you bring up the feral humans because mm. I, I was just talking earlier and I've, I've been on a tear lately of sharing crypto things with people and I don't know that I shared it with you, but there was just a sighting of, of basically a feral human in Germany. In the Hirsch Mountains. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I did of, not know that. Of a wolf man. I did not know yeah. that. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it was literally recently. Mm-hmm. I will bring it up right now as we're talking and show it to you and mm-hmm. show it to the camera because it is, it's phenomenal to know that there have been stories about things uh, just lit- put in wolf and it's the first thing that popped okay. up. Okay. I'll have a look through it. I'll so, yeah, out of DailyMail.uk, folks, naked, uh, mysterious naked, quote, wolf man spotted in Germany's Harz Mountains. Hikers take photo of man naked holding a wooden spear near a ruined castle. Well, <laughs> well that's it. Yeah, th- th- they're often naked and, uh, you know, they could at least have the decency to wear pants when you're trying to do your show live <laughs> conference. <laughs> Wolfman. Well, well, let's get into some of these sightings because um, one of the things that I've talked about with people before is Cherokee little people. Yeah, that is one of the many stories over there. The mm-hmm. the Hobbit like folks that and you've live got, in the woods, and you've got the moon eyed people as well, mm-hmm. and the traditions about them. Yeah. So I've always interested, as you know, from, in the cultural anthropology behind these yeah. things, and many people would say, um, objectively, well. Okay, I'm suspicious of the idea of, of Bigfoot, and I sure. understand that. Sure. But but um, many people would not say, "Well, I'm suspicious of the idea that people could go feral and live in that environment." Tennessee, let me tell you, the ecosystem certainly in the Smokies is a pretty easy system to survive in. Oh yeah, to a lot of other places, the winters are really mild. Yeah, it's pretty much always something to eat. The bears, who where there are so many bears there, it's ridiculous. Yeah, but the bears really don't hibernate very yeah, often. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's not a hard hibernation no. like they go through in the Northeast. It's very soft. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very easy place to live and there are many thousands of acres of forest. So if you were so minded or if you had some sort of mental illness that caused you to go there, it would be very easy to become feral there. Mm. And there are also uh, plentiful cave systems in yeah. the area under the Smokies. So, you know, let's, ex- let's extrapolate that. So what Please. you say is... You have, a, you have stories about Bigfoot, you have stories about disappearance cases. Mm-hmm. What if there were feral people who were causing some of these stories who, who could adapt to that environment mm-hmm. and live there? One thing I think there's an important point to also add is if these people did things like that, it wouldn't be in large groups, I think it would be isolated pockets, and they would have to have a lot of cultural regression. So yeah. what, what do I mean by cultural regression? Mm they would have to have no fires, no fires. Why do I say that? Because fires act as a beacon of attraction. Mm. Yeah? Sure, sure. Um, it's slightly different, but say I, when I was in Mongolia, I was once, I worked out, I was in a very remote part of Mongolia. Mongolia is the size of Western Europe, but it only had a few million people living there, like three million. Yeah. Um, and there, and I, there was one time when I was me and, and my driver and my translator and I worked out that the nearest person was probably 50 miles away. Wow. At that point, it was wow. super remote. Just sat there around a little fire, having a couple of vodkas, because that's what you do in Mongolia. I know I don't need an excuse, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> so, so but, but, but if in that circumstance, um, there, I had seen a fire, yeah. and it was maybe five or 10 miles away, yeah. I would have gone to it. All right? Absolutely. With the same thing, you think about the smoke as if you suddenly start seeing fires well, in the it's forest. A it's a yeah, signal. It's a signal. Absolutely. And people would go to it. Part in, not, not necessarily hikers, but also the parks. It would be like, what's that smoke? You know. Mm. So 
they would have to have no fire as a starting point. They would have to be um, very isolated. But there's something strange in the park. You know, there's been a few occasions um, which I've been looking at recently, not just the Dennis Martin case. I went to Spence Field. Oh, wow. The famous Dennis Martin case. You can see it on my Adam Davis uh, public Facebook page. I went there. I've been there twice in the last month or so. But also there's a couple of others um, where people have disappeared. There's one guy, I'll post it next week. He's like, in 1991, he, he was balanced. He lives on the edge of the park. He has, um, he has a 100-acre uh, farm. He's successful. His car is found. His car is in gear. All his personal possessions are in it. Yeah? And then his ATV is found. Mm. Then he's not found. There's a search. It's just as large as the Dennis Martin thing. Yeah. He used cadaver dogs. Nothing. His son suspect foul play. Where is he? He's disappeared. Yeah. yeah. And I went there as well very recently. Mm. So, I mean, so, you know, what I've been doing is, is, is investigating whether there's a plausibility to the feral human cases. Is it, is it um, if it is, is it just um, rogue individuals or is there a group? Yeah. And how does that tie in? with, say, potential Bigfoot activity? Is it something distinct or is it something different? And sure. that's what I'm working on. Sure, happen. sure. Well, well, and I mean, even the idea is, is there a breeding population of feral humans and, and a society that is living outside of society? You yeah, know? and I think it would be very hard for that to happen, I have to say. If it, it, and they would have to be very transient, small, mm. and it would have to be highly... It would have to be a just like be, small family group. Yeah, it would be a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, but it would not be impossible to do. Well, sure, sure. I mean, the, one of the things that we do regularly whenever we talk Bigfoot cryptids is show the picture of the United States from mm -hmm. the ISS at night. Um, there is a lot of black. It's a lot of black, yeah. not a lot of light when it comes to nighttime. So there, and especially in Tennessee, there is a lot of back hill. There's a lot of back country. There are many thousands of acres. And, and of yeah. course, people, understandably, stick to the trails, yeah? Mm -hmm. You and I can easily be... Well, it's what we're taught to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, exactly. Unless and you're that, an experienced woodsman, that's what you're taught to and do. And that's quite right. But, you know, we could be literally three or four feet away from where we are now in yeah. the trail, and we'd never be seen by people. Absolutely. Never. I mean, and yeah. so... Even when you say there are there are trails and these are where people go, the reality of the situation is, it's very easy to to to, to um, slip off into the. Into oh the sure, sure, absolutely. I was I was talking with King Gerhardt yesterday about about the fact of um, disappearances in Alaska, things like that. Is it the fact of um, they actually disappeared or that they wanted to disappear? Well, it, you can, know, it they, can be both. I it's mean, a, it's a great place to just go and vanish it's fast i mean i've been to alaska a couple of times i went to port chatham as you know yeah. before they made the tv series mm -hmm. and, all that and uh yeah i mean i it, it's funny the creatures will behave differently there because they're not used to people yeah. so before the tv series for the first time i went to port chatham there were a lot of otters and the otters had never seen some of the otters had never seen people before because I, I i pitched the camp there was me and Stephen. Major and um, a cameraman, Josh, and uh, you know Stephen had financed it, so credit to him. But the initial excursion was just a, was a few days, and I wanted to see what it was. So I wanted to position my my team um, opposite uh, the Port Chatham itself, so I could observe, but also on a spit of land. So if anything weird did come along, mm. it was a, it was defendable, and I had yeah, yeah. we had two watches, so we, there was always two people awake at any one time. Um, but the the interesting thing about how creatures behave in that situation is the baby otters were being held up by the parents to see the humans. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Which was which was very cool. Yeah, I was just about to ask otters specifically were they were they curious or afraid? Super curious. I mean, they, <laughs> they'd come towards the beach and, and yeah, yeah. like at night it'd be like the otter show and the, the otters were watching us and we were watching them. Yeah. Not all the time, but it was like quite cool to see yeah. them behaving so, like your that. Your own nature show right there in front <laughs> yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and it is remarkable, especially when you're talking about being out in the woods, stuff like that. Like, you you could be ten if unless you're a trained hunter, things like that. You could be ten feet away from a deer and never know it. Never know. No, it. no you could. You, you could. I mean, it, and they, and animals will behave very differently yeah. when they've had contact with humans. I think that's the point. Mm -hmm. I talked yesterday about how 
a clouded leopard had come into my camp in Nepal because it was curious and it was like, yeah. you know, doing that. And it just walked in and while me and Ian Redmond, you and Ambassador for, for Gorillas, we just sat there having a whiskey and there's the clouded leopard, you know what I mean? Yes. And, and, um, and I think, you know, you have this behavior of animals, mm. which is very different in remote areas as opposed to areas where you see a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, there was an interesting case out of, uh, and I want to say it was Tennessee a few years ago, of an eight-year-old girl that went missing for nine days, uh, ended up popping back up and saying she was cared for by a bear uh, in a cave. It that was she was no bear. <laughs> that she was taken by a bear. And, 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 like, to me, yeah. kid from the 80s, I just, I just thought of Maggie Simpson <laughs> <laughs> in the bear, like, you know teaching all the bears and stuff like that like being in charge of them all uh that's what popped into my head first but yeah it was one of those well an, an eight-year-old kid would definitely identify that as a bear yeah, unless totally, unless yeah. like this is one of your parents and they're into cryptids things like that like you may not have heard yeah, of bigfoot you, you as would. an eight-year-old no it's totally i mean in reality a bear or even a feral human or even a feral human, especially if you're talking like what we just showed, where mm. covered head to toe in hair. Well, they, they like wear that. furs because because they have to wear some sort. You got to wear something to keep they, they'd warm. They wear and, furs and, yeah. they, and they behave, uh, you know, slightly differently. Mm. But you know, it obviously wasn't a bear. If it was a bear, it would have eaten her. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a, that. that is a meal. Uh, absolutely, too yeah. bad. So, so what took her? Yeah, what, what took her? What not just took her, took care of her. Well, that's her. the important thing. That's yeah. the important no, no, that's thing, the is the that it, it cared Absolutely. for her. It cared for her, which it is a human. It fed her, it kept her warm. Human like, thing. Because there's no way I'm, uh, nine days. Not, you know, like, you, yeah. you're out in the field, you're going to places like Nepal, you're going out looking for Yeti, things like that, with zero supplies. What are your chances as a grown man of nine days? It would be very tough. It would be very hard. Tough. It would be hard. And you know how to make fire. You know how to purify water. You know how to find food to eat. Well, the food. An, no. an eight-year-old <coughs> she doesn't been, know all those things. She would have been dead of dehydration. Yeah. No. Yeah, precisely. So it's one of those, like like you said, not a bear. Something took care of her and make sure that she had those things that you need to survive. Yeah. So even to think of... Not Bigfoot, but feral human, you know. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think that those, those sort of things are particularly interesting mm. in Tennessee. I think Tennessee is perfectly adapted for that. You know, yeah. as, you, as you know, the forests of Michigan would be very cold and hard for yeah. people to do. I mean, it's doable, but yeah. there's no better place I've ever been than Tennessee. For the, if you want to have a feral human population, then that's the perfect place. Well, definitely. and, uh, you know, many, many people living in the back hills, stuff like that still, um, in, the, in the foothills of the Appalachians, mm. stuff like that. So the, the idea of somebody living fully off grid, occupying caves, things like that, not, yeah. not crazy to think about. No, it's not, it's not. I mean, it, it's difficult. It's, I'm not saying that, that, that it, I'm not trying to advocate that that's what happened because at the moment, I'd say it's more unlikely than not that it's feral people, but, mm. um, I'm not going to invent. I'm not going to investigate something that's wildly implausible. If there's yeah. if there's some a narrative to it, and I think that the, the, the is is supportable. Yeah. And I'll look into it. And that's what I've been doing there. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it's good. I mean, I'm glad to hear that because that is it's a, an interesting point of research that I don't think anybody has really taken on. And not for a while. They've researched stories, but mm -hmm. they've not done a lot of the physical investigation. Yeah. So I've been trying to do that, and and you know I'll do that for a little bit longer. And then uh, we'll see what I turn my mind to next. You know, yeah. I'm never, never quite sure. I've been doing a lot of. I, I mean, I've I've also been doing. You know, it's nothing not connected with cryptos, but I've been doing a little bit of paranormal stuff recently. Really? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Cool. So How have you I, been liking that? I enjoyed it. It was different. Now I've always had an interest in it, uh. but I've never really pursued it that much. But cool. Um, recently, I have. Okay. And. and um, I'll tell you one story, actually. Please, I've not told anyone else. So Chris is my friend, so I'm going to tell him a story. I'm going to give him an exclusive. Thank you. Um, so, and this happened by accident, not by... I mean, there's, there's a few things I, which I've investigated, which I found have happened because of my investigation. But this is... Mm. I'm not going to take credit for this. This is it. So I went to West Virginia and spent some time there. And uh, for part of the time, I stayed 
in a house. And I just got a very weird vibe about this house. Very, very strange. You know when you go in somewhere and you feel like, uh, it's almost like a repressed feeling, and there was a particular mm -hmm. room in this house where I went into, where I had like butterflies in my stomach for mm. a bit. I felt very uncomfortable. I just felt it. And I thought, I don't, just don't feel great about this. And I was staying there with another person and they had a dog with them, so there's three of us in the house. And it was one of those um, Airbnbs, yeah? Okay. So, so it's in a fairly remote area, but not very remote, but that's it. So I'd, when the days when I was staying there, lock up the house, go out. But this room was weird and I noticed the dog kept looking in a corner of the room when we went in and I'm like, <laughs> and then at night, I felt like, you know, if I went to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I feel like, oh, shit, I feel like something's watching me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, what have I got to lose? It's not really what I was there for. I was doing Bigfoot research, mm. yeah? Um, I thought, I'm going to stick up a trail camera just in this room and see what happens. So I lock the door of this, this bedroom. I stick up a trail camera. The door's locked, remember. I stick up a trail camera and <clears throat> left it, pulled it up, went back home and there's a face in the trail camera photograph of a Ooh. guy and you can see part of his face and there's a guy and he looks like he's wearing some sort of military uniform okay wow so i got the um so there's two explanations for this number and both of them are creepy number one it's some sort of spirit yeah and it's taken a, and it's and it because i said to it so if you want to show yourself, show yourself on this trail camera. This is what a trail camera is. Show yourself on it yeah. if you want to do that. That's what I, I should, you know, I, I did as a detail. Or um, it's somebody who broke into the house, yeah, saw that there was a trail camera in the house, and it was only that night I set it up. Yeah. So it didn't, I hadn't left it. They would have had to have broken into the house, got past me, got past another bedroom, got past the dog, which got is a- Got past the locked door. Got past the locked door, and the dog's a pit bull, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's not It's not like little, yeah, yeah. you know. And got into that room, specifically take, take the photograph, stole nothing, and then left, and did yeah, the yeah, yeah. process back. It was one or two. So it's one of the, <laughs> so it's either that, or it's a spirit. Now, if you're very skeptical and you don't like those things to say, well, it's just a weirdo, somehow he knew that that was your objective and he broke in and yeah, did yeah. that. But that becomes increasingly implausible, or it's some sort of spirit. So what happens, so I got my friend to contact the owner of the Airbnb, and she felt, and so it, she felt that it may well be her relative who was 19 years old, who died in Vietnam. He, she said that this was the place where me and him used to like to play. Uh, wow. This was a childhood memory. And I just thought that's a fascinating story. And that's, that's the first awesome. time I've, I've talked about it, yeah? Wow, what an so, incredible experience, yeah, man. Interesting. That is, interesting. That is wild. That yeah. is wild. And uh, how, how uh, has that changed you in any way? Is that... No, there's a couple of... I mean, I, I, it would take a long time to explain, but there's a couple of, of strange paranormal experiences I've okay. had over the last year or so that got me into that. There was something All in Michigan right. before that, that that really got me into it. But I thought it was fascinating. I think the photograph's interesting. Yeah. And, and I can accept that some people may well say, well, that's just a weirdo breaking in, but why? And then why would he not steal anything? And how would he know about my experiment? And why would he do that and lock the lock door yeah, yeah, after, yeah, yeah. you know? It's just it's, too, a, it's a chain yeah. of implausibility. It's a chain of implausibility, which leads me to think it could be something. Uh, mm. And I'll put that up at some stage, I'm sure. The yeah, photograph. yeah. I've yeah. thought about it for a while, and I've thought about it, and I thought, do I want that level of attention right now? And I was busy doing a lot of things in in, um, in uh, Tennessee, mm. and I thought, no, I don't want that yet, because I, I think if I blow it, if I put it up, it's going to just blow up. You know? Yeah, it's a, well, I mean, it's it's a big one to yeah, think about. Yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> and, and do I want it on that one? Because I've always prioritized my, um, I've always prioritized my. Uh, field work for looking for new species and trying to get scientific evidence of those. Yeah. The paranormal thing has been something that uh, it's intrigued it? me because it's been fun, but it's happened. There's been a few hits I've had. Yeah. That was by accident, but there's been, a, well, I suppose it wasn't in some ways that I set the tr 
trail camera up. You know what sure, I mean? Sure. So I did think of that. Yeah. But it wasn't planned to get that photograph. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been a few things that, you know, have interested me in the paranormal field that I thought, well, you know, I'll investigate this. Yeah. I don't know. You, you, you see, what I've always felt is that, you know, with science, I want science to evaluate evidence. And I'm never, yeah. never going to change on that point. But then also I thought, well, my understanding, I mean, always have been intellectually curious, Chris, as you yeah, know. Yeah. I'm not, you know, doing TV, TV shows was never a plan of mine. It was a byproduct of the things of, that Of I, your I, curiosity. Yeah, my curiosity your research. just happened. Yeah. yeah, and my research. And I'm, ultimately, that's what drives me. I'm, I'm interested in answers and exploring. Yeah. Exploring necessarily nature, but also we can explore our own understandings on our own consciousness and persona it, outside that. You know, it was really great um, during the NASA UFO UAP panel mm -hmm. that happened about a month or so ago to to hear the scientists themselves say that they have woefully been re disregarding their responsibility as scientists by by simply continuing to confirm known quantitative instead of investigating the yeah. the three to five percent anomaly that's actively there. Well, it, that's you the know? yeah, that's the interesting thing. I mean, it's, it's no good reaffirming what you already know. You have to explore the boundaries. <laughs> And you have to suspend your ego and say, well, actually, I could, be, I could be wrong. And actually, being wrong sometimes is a good thing. It's a great it's thing. It's a good thing because you, you, you're, you're making progress. Well, confirming what isn't gets you closer to confirming what is. Yeah. You know, and it's one of those, whenever I go to a targeted individual's house, I don't break out my RF equipment first and start scanning for signals. No. I go with known quantitative first. Let's pull out my radon detector. Yeah. Let's see if maybe you have a radon leak in your house somewhere. Let's pull out my gas meter, see if maybe you're living on a fault line. You yeah. know, you could have some sort of natural gas leak in your house that you're not aware of um, that could be causing these phenomenon, all kinds of stuff. We will get rid of the known quantitative and then leave anomalous. And now we'll start looking at that. Yeah. But let's get rid of the known quantitative first. Exactly. You know? I mean, and you know, you always have to be aware. And I, and I think in, in any of these circumstances, this the adage which you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof yeah and i think the problem with investigating those sort of things is it's very difficult to quantify the data and analyze it objectively yeah. to get that proof but it's still a, a, a real damn good adventure and, and, well, and, that well, and that's great. just it that's yeah. the beautiful thing about real real science adam is that it is magellan mm. it is that idea of well, okay maybe the horizon ends there who wants to hop on the ship with me and find out? Yeah. Yeah. Because it took one crazy dude to be like, maybe it doesn't end there. Let's sail to it. Yeah. And let's keep going. Let's do it. And yeah. let's keep going. Like, you know, yeah. and, and we need more of that almost reckless abandon in science where, <laughs> where you're really willing to put aside everything that you know. It's very And explore it from a ground zero point of view. Yeah, and it's very safe to reaffirm oh, what's sure. already been known, and you can have a yeah. good career doing that. But, well, but it's how but, textbooks but it's, are written. It's how curricula come about. Yeah, but ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, I don't think you you know if you have intellectual quant, quant, uh, curiosity, you're never gonna you're never gonna quench that thirst by reading a textbook. Yeah. You need to read the textbook in order to do the initial groundwork. But after that, keep going back and looking at the same text. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. No. No. At some point, it comes down to that that point of real science hypothesis and so many times we forget about the fact that it starts with hypothesis and you're allowed to hypothesize anything yeah and you should and you should that's how you build ideas exactly and through the testing of that hypothesis we'll prove whether or not there's a found of founding of a theorem there you know and then from there further proof will lead to fact of nature or law of science what have you but it starts with that imagination point of hypothesis. And the, the root of that is thesis and hypo. Hypo being huge. Yeah. Huge. You know, um, it, it's the point of expanding that. And how far are you willing to expand that thesis? Because the further you expand the thesis, the more possibilities there are. You exactly. Know? Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we have to be willing to do that. We have to be willing to do that even as even as skeptics. 
Yeah. You know, <clears throat> like a skeptic is a really, really dirty word in this industry. And that's that's kind of sad. Well, because, it shouldn't be. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it, I, I think it's good for you to have people to challenge your actions and opinions. Well, sure. It's providing it's respectful and, well, and not. And well, in my job as a skeptic, getting to punch holes in your stuff or no. anything like that, it's to be ready to have my mind changed mm-hmm. and to change my set of data from the points of datum you provide. Exactly. That's uh, my job. But but I also think as well, it's important for you to read and understand other people's yeah. uh, ideas which you might not necessarily agree with. That's right. Uh, it's very important to do that. It's like being in debate. In, in all it's like being in debate. Absolutely. You've you know, got to be able to see the other point, person's point of view. In order to understand it. Absolutely. Exactly. It's very important. And I always encouraged my students when I was teaching and also when I when I was younger, I was always like, Okay, well, this person's views are very diametrically opposed to mine. I should read them, not just dismiss them. That's right. And, and that, that I, I would encourage anybody who listens yep. to your uh, show to do that. Yeah, find, try and find people who have a, a polar opinion. Absolutely. Opposite opinion to yours, and, and, it, and don't just look at re- reaffirmation. It is, it is one of the things I have preached on my show for the longest since we were dudes and beer. If you're going to read yeah. news, I don't care if it's science news, what have you, Read a couple of opinions you agree with. Read two that you vehemently disagree with. Read three from outside the U.S. Perfect. That's perfect. Because now you're that. getting even outside of no, your I cultural lo- I love point that. of view. And, and one of the points I've just thought about tangentially, because this is, again, I think this is important, yeah. is our Googles and the, and the problem mm-hmm. with algorithms is algorithms... It curates to you and your taste. It's Exactly. It's reaffirming our biases. So That's your right. Google... And my Google, if we even if we have mm-hmm. broadly similar opinions, and I think we do, but but but, but it's going to look different. Yep. My my Google, you know, there's a young lady over there, Melissa. Um, hers would be totally different to yeah. mine because she's a woman. She's a different age group. Yeah. She probably has different opinions. Her to me. searches come up yeah. differently. The way she Her searches, searches are the different. The idea that we're using unbiased tech. Yes. In order to look for information, it's not like a library. Bring it in. It's not like a and library. It's not a library. It's not. It's, and it's affirming, reaffirming our own biases. And people don't realize that. They the, need to. And one of the things I bring up all the time, Adam, is the fact of, uh, like, I am old enough to remember riding a bicycle to the library, mm. looking things up on microfiche. Maybe Wonderful the library things. didn't even have it. So I had to order it from the downtown library or go there to get it. We are now at a point where that library is in our hands, where, where our brains yes, were made yes. to be a sieve, to filter information mm. from a faucet, a trickle, yeah. a hand pump, you know? Yeah. We now have a torrential downpour of data that the gutter is overflowing and there's so much that the colander cannot sift it. It's overflowing the sides. Yeah. And people trying to be able to sift and sort that information, it takes time to absorb. Not everybody can absorb, yeah. process, and spit out information that fast. Not everybody's brains can process things that quickly. It takes an absorptive process for you to bring it in, absorb it, see how it reacts to your life, your, your range of looking at things. We are bombarded with so much information so fast that the filter's clogged. Uh, yeah, the filter's absolutely. clogged. Absolutely, but all, all the time as well, all the time. And, and then you've got the bias to deal with at that same yeah, moment. Yeah, all the time that bias is trying to work out yeah. what it should show you. Yep. Yeah, not se- on yeah. a sentient level, eventually that'll be coming in. <laughs> but, 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 but what should it show you? What should it show you to, yeah. to make itself more efficient? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it provides for your needs better, so I can put more advertisements in it. Yeah. And, and, what, how, and, 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 and that, I think that's a, a worry. I think it's a worry now that, that, that everything is being tailored. Uh, you know, if you're a young person now, if you're like 14, studies 15, are being tailored, man. Tailored. Study results are being tailored. But it's yeah, uh, uh, and you've got the chat. But everything, everything is now confirmation bias, and yeah. you, and actually, you think it's an illusion to think. Oh yes, I have access to all the information. I just have to Google everything. That's an illusion. Yeah. You do not, because you are constantly confirmation biasing. If, if your you're information. doing that, you need to dig down into page seven or eight. Yes. You need to dig yeah, you need way to go down. down into Google 
and get to things yeah. that would not be within that bias of what you're yeah, searching because the, they're there. But the top, the but top you ain't, ones are you ain't what making you it. See. You ain't making it pass. You're typically not scrolling down the first whole page of search results to no. begin with before you start clicking things. Yeah. No, so I, I, yeah, I, yeah, most of that in that top Google search range is going to be what you typically look up. Yeah. It's you know? what I want. Yeah. Let's get it. Yeah, yeah. And it's that's the not how the library it's used the, to work. It's the Brondo. It's what plants crave. Yes. It's what plants crave. <laughs> well, that's it. Well, the, the library, the last thing we'll talk about in the library, because this yeah. is, it's a good discussion. I haven't had this discussion around it before. The library, you know, you could wander down those aisles and you could see. It was all visual. Yeah. You could see. Yeah. I could pick out this book, that well, book. And you could I, you take know, your time. I could take my time. You could and peruse a book. There's a philosophy I really struggle with. It's yeah. abhorrent to me. I'm going to read it, you know. There yeah. it is. But but the tech won't give you that. You no. have to really search. You do. Yeah. You do. And that's and just it. Be, and the, many people can't be bothered with that. The it, And that's just it. And that, that becomes an endemic part of the problem as well, is that you can't be bothered to search deeper. You don't have time to search deeper. No time. And I've got 20 minutes. I need it yeah. now. Give me this information exactly. now. Exactly. Now, and, AI. and research papers do not happen now. Oh. Proper research doesn't happen now. That is curated over a long period of time. And and that's just it. Even field research, it's one of those that is curated over a long period of time. To to even right now, for you to say you had any kind of answer regarding your field research into wild men living ages. in the Tennessee ages. Hills. It might be never. might it, be ages. It, it, who knows? Who knows? But yeah. it's the continuous search for data and the continuing culling of data. And the one thing I have been saying about AI is that I, I can't wait till MUFON turns AI loose on 50 years of MUFON cases. <laughs> the patterns that it's going to find that we haven't even thought oh, about are going to be massive. Massive, and it's going to be the same thing. They're talking about using AI for wildlife call identification in Sasquatch hunting, things like that, to be able to rapidly put a call against a database of things to see if it lies within a known range quantitative of animals in the yeah. area. Beautiful things like that for this kind and field of research mm. that these new technologies oh, are yeah. going to bring to there's us. It's one, great. There's some it's wonderful. Beautiful. There's some wonderful positives. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, and, and it's interesting within our lifetime to see the progress. Yeah. So, you know, when I first do, started to do expeditions, and if I was doing, let's just take Sumatra as an ample example, because mm. this is a good example. Sure. So when I first started to do expeditions to Sumatra, I used to write a letter to my guides, and maybe it would get there, maybe it wouldn't, and maybe I'd get a reply in a few months. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course computers started to come in and so maybe when they got to an email place they'd send an email maybe mm. they wouldn't and there was one woman who had a phone in the village and i'd phone up and i'd say i wanted to speak to sahara who was my chief guide yeah. then. hold on and let me go a few doors down and get him well i'd call back in an hour <laughs> i'd call back in an hour because i knew he'd be waiting an hour yeah, so yeah one hour time block was easy to do for mm -hmm. them so i'd say i want out then I get, then a few years later, I come out of the jungle one time, I'm exhausted and my clothes are ripped, blah, blah, blah. We stagger all, it, we were all wet through, we stagger towards Sahar's village, which is on the edge of the jungle. And we go in and there's one TV in the village, he has it, and SpongeBob SquarePants is playing, you know? Like, <laughs> like this. And I'm like, sheesh, this is so surreal. This is weird. SpongeBob, yeah, this is weird. <laughs> and now, you know, his kids, uh, Facebooking live from the edge of the very jungle, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was like yeah. considered thanks semi to, impenetrable. Th thanks to Starlink. Yeah, it's like okay, <laughs> we're here, and behind me is Bobby the Gibbon. You know, and it's yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. And the yeah. Gibbon's like, oh, yeah, the and village like, Gibbon. <laughs> and it, like it's like it's that transition, yeah, that rapidity. You know, if you were a medieval peasant, you'd see nothing for hundreds of years. Yeah. There'd be no technological yeah. leaps. Yeah. yeah. In my lifetime, I've visibly seen exponential leaps, which our ancestors would have considered implausible, well, even if they understood the tech. Even you know? the logistics of putting together an expedition, like you were yeah, saying, the idea of, of you would write a letter. Yeah. Maybe a month or so later, you'd get yeah. a letter back. Yeah. Like the rapidity of being able to assemble an expedition now, of being able to go online, apply for your visa yeah. to the country. 
Not well, fill out a form, no, send it to an embassy and wait for an embassy to reply. Like, it's almost I, immediate. If I wanted to do something like that in that particular area, mm. Nina, I have it all wrapped up in a week easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All wrapped up. I mean, you know, where... I, and and it's, it's amazing now how... I mean, people are very... But the other thing I'd say is, you know, people are very connected, yeah? Yeah. So when I was teaching, so I look at my cell phone here, we're in a way we're almost cybernal, cybernetic because, you know, if I asked any of these people at this conference today and we talked about phones and stuff, a lot of them would be, I know, I understand, would be very upset if they didn't have their phone for even an hour. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. For a yeah. day, they'd be devastated. Yeah. yeah for, and that's that. so so people might think they're independent yeah. of technology but really they're not no you know, they're really no. they're not even even not, not just on a functional good level. lord look at what happened to us when we had no toilet paper for a week oh my gosh adam yeah a week phones, <laughs> i would say i would say phones would be worse <laughs> yeah phones would be yeah. worse if you had if you had no internet if the uh, internet went no down internet, for a week no internet you yeah. know and people uh, people rely on it that it would be madness it, it would be yeah, that'd good, be like, good oh, lord, we turn car, we turn cars over and burn towns because the team won. <laughs> well, Imagine it, if that happened. Well, it, it, you are, you are. I mean, Madness. It, it, the, people say, oh, you know, I'm independent. Oh, what about all this? You know, you, you talk about um, cybernetic technology coming in. Yeah, we're already cybernetic. It's just not. It's just not on. It's not molded to a to your body in the same way. You're as already I, fully connected. You're and, fully connected. And your endorphin system is already fully connected. Well, that's my next <laughs> point. You're, it's, it's a Borg thing almost for those people who are in Star Trek. You're already a kind of Borg. Yeah. Because yeah, I I, I remember te- I was teaching a Japanese kid one time, and. Um, I was using a, f- a cell phone as an example. I remember I asked him if I could use his cell phone for an example because mine was on the desk mm. and I was on the other side of the classroom. And he said, yeah. And then I noticed uh, while I was talking, talking about the various terminology connected with the phone, he got, he got very nervous and stressed. And I saw his hand actually, I gave wow. him his phone back. I saw his hand, he started to drink water. And I had the phone in my hand for five or six minutes. But he was so connected with his phone. Yeah. The thought of me having his phone freaked him out. I gave him back as soon as yeah, I saw yeah, that. Yeah. But it was like wow. worrying. Yeah, no. It was worrying. But, you know, if you said to people, and it's not just young people, if you said to people, you know, you, you, know, how, you don't have your phone for four days, well, how would you do? What do you think? They'd be like... Oh, yeah. my, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And it caused relationship problems. If you don't phone your wife and on the internet or whatever, you'd be in a I'll, I'll give you a soft experiment, folks. For a long time, uh, Adam, I practiced uh, Black Sabbath. So the idea of no technology on whatever you want to call your Sabbath day. You want to call it Wednesday because yeah. that's your day off work? Great. Yeah. No television. No phone. No internet. Go fishing. Go, go do good. some gardening. Go do something. Go play guitar in a, in a dark room, whatever. But return back to a point pre-electricity yeah. for a day. It's Unplug. Good. Unplug for a day. Get away from it all. And, and see how you feel. Oh, like, yeah, just sorry, as a yeah. personal experience. Like, for give it four weeks. Give it one month of... One day a week. One day a week. And put your, people, you can put do your that. phone in a drawer. You can do that. You're not asking to cut yourself off from society. No. no. We just, used yeah. to be that way. Yeah. Not too long ago, where, where we weren't inundated with this, where we had a... Uh, do you remember when you remembered 50 phone numbers? Yeah, you have 50 to. 50 10-digit yeah, phone yeah, numbers? Now, now I, I know... I struggle to remember my own. I, I know remember. one that can take a collect call just in case yeah. I get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one phone number that will be able to accept a collect call. I don't have a Rolodex in my head anymore. It's on my phone. Yeah. You know? Everything. And we have sacrificed a lot to that. We've sacrificed evidentiary process to that. Mm. We, we have sacrificed our want of confirmation to that. So many things um, we have put into that box and put into that kitty. So, yeah, yeah like we, we have to be ready as people, even as a field researcher, a citizen scientist, we have to be willing to put those things aside and look at the bigger picture, look at things from outside of our lens. 
You Definitely. Know? So, yeah. And well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been uh, Chris and, uh, and Adam's philosophy. That's right. Lecture for the day. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, 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 when the show started, the idea was like I was telling you earlier. It, it was a deep conversation about humanity yeah. and, and people and where we were going. And this has all roiled to the top of the pot. All paranormal, UFO, UAP, cryptid, like all of this stuff is roiling to the top of the pot right now in our society. And it's interesting to see this return to spiritualism, like this this true centennial point of view. Like mm. when you look back at the 1920s, that's what we were going through. You know, when yeah. you look back to the beginning of the 1900s, it was the beginning of the spiritualist movement. It was uh, all of these things, paranormal ghosts, all of that stuff was right at the top of the roiling pot and we're right there again so the difference is we have a realm of technology now yes we're no longer following humors in no. our body we know about medicine we know about all these things yes but yet still that spirituality and that spiritualism is coming to the top despite the science well i think and we it's have awesome an, yeah and i agree it's I awesome. think we have an intrinsic need for it yeah as human we beings we have an intrinsic need yeah for something spiritual oh absolutely to be divorced from that is to be um hollow yeah i remember there's a great one of the people great skeptics and atheists i knew he died but as he was dying, he knew he was dying, and he wanted a moment. He even he wanted a moment, a revelatory moment at the end, uh, as he died, which would be some sort of cognizant download of information or mm, spiritual. Yeah, the moment. akashic records get released. Yeah, he had something that he wanted. He wasn't quite sure what mm. it would be, but he wanted a moment of knowledge or a moment of spirituality, even at his death, even though he denied yeah. the existence of God. Sure, sure. That's what he wanted. You don't have and to I believe think, in God to have a spiritual moment. No. It's a beautiful thing. And I think he's, I, I think that that's, that's, a, <clears throat> that's always going to be a fundamental need in human nature, yeah. Yeah. One last question, Adam. What do you want before you go? Uh, I have, and I think that's a good question. I, 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 I hope... I'm not. I'm no, never out to evangelise people. Yeah. Um, I. I would like. I hope people enjoy my books. I hope they enjoy the, the expedition books and the fiction books because I've enjoyed writing those after I got long COVID. Sure. And I started to recover from that. Um, so I hope that people enjoy those. That's what I'd like, on a on a personal level as well. I just. I'd like to see, a bigfoot type creature. I would love to do that. I've seen. That's Story. what I love. I is love it. Sans experience. You still research <laughs> yeah, this stuff. I would love you, just, have, you have not seen a big. No, foot. I've never seen one. You know, like, I'd like yeah. to see one. I've seen other things, that are strange things, but very rarely in over decades. It's not like things pop out all the time. Yeah, yeah. But that's the one thing I've wanted to see since I was a kid. So I'd like that ambition to be realized one day. So very okay. simply, that would be good for me. I'd be happy. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, and there you have it. There you have it, Adam. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know you've been over there working your table hard. Yeah. Thanks for pulling away and coming over here and having this truly, truly deep and personal conversation. No, I've us. enjoyed it, Chris. It's Chris is always a Chris is, always, is is a super nice guy. I'll say this. He doesn't know I'm going to say this, he, but he's, <laughs> he's 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 very caring and an intellectual. And you know, I like having this. Com I wanted to have this conversation with him because he's a good man and he's doing good stuff with his work. There Thank you. I greatly appreciate that, Adam. Let everybody know where they can go to keep up with your work or they can go to buy your books follow you on social media and all your research well the, the, the easiest place is, is adam davis facebook d-a-v-i-e-s they can see me there adam davis explorer.com the website and uh you know my books are on amazon too awesome thanks so much for the time but right. i appreciate it all right, while you're online checking out all of adam's work make sure to stop on by curiousrealm.com that's where you can find all the episodes. That's where you can like, follow, subscribe. That's where you can fill out our experiencer form at CuriousRealm.com forward slash story. Share your experience of the paranormal cryptids or UFOs, UAPs. Uh, you can share your evidence with us as well, your pictures, videos, audio. We will present it to our researchers and professionals and try to find some answers for you. Stay tuned through these commercial breaks. We'll be right back with our final bit of coverage from day two of the second annual Dogman Encrypted Festival right here in White Settlement, Texas, brought to you by the Paranormal Roundtable. We'll be right back after this.